we have the pleasure of having uh, Adriana Navarro, who is a Sydney-based lawyer. Adriana has been working uh, in her private law firm for several decades now. Um, Adriana has also been working with the various uh, solidarity and human rights organizations in Latin America and specifically in, in Chile. And she is, is involved in the Adriana Rivas uh, case. Um, Adriana Rivas is an alleged former agent of Pinochet's uh, DINA um, uh, organization, which was a, a military or an intelligence apparatus of, of the dictatorship. And she has now been, uh, she is currently in detention in a correctional facility here in Sydney, Australia. So I'm just uh, wondering, uh, Adriana, if we could start uh, in terms of, you, if you could just provide us with some, some general background information. Who is Adriana Rivas and why is she currently sitting in a correctional facility here in Sydney, Australia? Certainly, and thank you for the invitation. Adriana Rivas was in fact a member of the Lautaro Brigade. The Lautaro Brigade was a, um, a extermination brigade set up by the um, uh, right hand of General Manuel Contreras, the chief of the DINA. Adriana Rivas uh, was um, um, sought by the Ministry of Defense in the early 70s as a very young woman and she joined the DINA. She's given interviews here in Sydney to SBS radio. And in those interviews, she herself says that um, she became a DINA agent around 1974, 1975, possibly a little bit earlier, that she was trained into in intelligence. She had several months of training and that um, she lived a, a great life, according to Mrs. Rivers, because she was taken overseas in surveillance work, in um, bodyguard type work for important dignitaries and visitors during the Pinochet regime. So that's the background, the general background to her. In this case, which is the extradition request for Adriana Rivers, um, there are allegations that she was involved in the kidnapping of seven uh, community, uh, Communist Party members in the late 75 to early 76. Um, and that those seven members of the Communist Party of Chile were tortured and then assassinated. And so she lives here in Sydney. Uh, she married a um, resident, an Australian uh, resident. And she came to Australia in 1978. Uh, that's the background of Rivers. Mm -hmm. Now, just to bring the case forward uh, to, to more sort of um, recent times, um, Rivas, uh, I understand, was uh, charged or was interviewed and had to report to a local police station or some sort of government institution in, in Chile. And she was being investigated for these murders, but uh, then, of course, I understand she fled um, through Argentina. And it wasn't until she actually gave that interview to an SBS uh, journalist, and until the members of the Chilean community began to 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 lobby and put uh, uh, pressure, political pressure, that Rivas was finally uh, arrested, and the whole extradition uh, process uh, commenced. Could you provide us with a little bit of information in terms of how that uh, yes, that process? Mm -hmm. So, in fact, uh, Rivas is a typical. Mm, I would say egocentric uh, type of person. You can see those traits in that interview that she gave to SBS. It, it is a very lengthy interview. It was given on the 40th anniversary of the coup d'etat uh, in uh, 2013. Now, uh, she says in that interview that she did not feel that there were any reasons not to return to Chile. But what we learned is that in around 2006, she went to Chile as she did frequently. And on that occasion, she was in fact arrested by uh, Chilean police. And by that time, uh, the uh, uh, courts in Chile had accumulated enough evidence to charge her with those seven aggravated kidnapping charges. Um, so she was arrested. The prosecution commenced in Chile. 
and she was given bail to remain in Chile. But by 2011, she had managed to organize, to abscond and flee the Chilean jurisdiction, and she came to Australia. In 2011 itself, as soon as the police in Chile became aware that she had left the jurisdiction, they issued a number of warrants for her arrest. So really it's not in 2013 that they work to arrest and find Rivas comments, but back in 2011. By 2012, we had a red alert warrant issued internationally. So the Australian police was aware of that. And we've seen, um, you can in fact have a look at um, court, the court documents, Chilean court documents and find those warrants. They also had an indication that she was back in Australia. So what happened is that between 2012 and 2013, police in Chile, international police, Interpol, etc., were looking for Adriana Rivers, and they had some old addresses for her here in Sydney. But she gave that interview, and of course that became known internationally, and it was much easier then to uh, be able to assert, yes, she is in Australia, she is in Sydney, and therefore the Australian uh, authorities were requested to act on an extradition request. Mm -hmm. That's that's so up to the extradition request. That it took several years for that request to be accepted because the Chilean legal system and the Australian legal system are completely different. They, uh, there were many technical difficulties to be able to assimilate what the Chilean system was. Uh, had done and requested and investigated that thus far on what the Australian system requires. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to return to the the latest developments in terms of her, her extradition, but um, I just would like uh, some, some of your comments in terms of uh, the film that uh, her niece uh, made uh, a few years ago. I saw the film, like many members of the Chilean uh, community here in Australia, and I thought it was certainly a very powerful and a serious condemnation. There was a lot of evidence there uh, presented in terms of who Adriana Rivas was, uh, not only a dinner agent and not only an alleged torturer, but apparently um, one of the worst torturers uh, from the Lautaro Brigade. Um, what did you what did you think of the film um what what are your what are your thoughts in general of of, of that connection um it is a valuable uh document um mm -hmm. to understand uh the background to rivers how it is that she became a dinner agent and involved in torture and the disappearance of not only seven people but possibly more the extradition deals with seven victims but there may be more in any event um we know that the film or the work for that film commenced several years earlier, perhaps in 2013 when she gave that interview. Um, and uh, the aim initially was to redeem Adriana Rivers, to actually find or, or, or argue that she was innocent. But mm. the uh, uh, niece, in fact, learned that it was highly improbable that Adriana Rivers was innocent. There, there are so many testimonies of co-defendants of Adriana Rivas that have been given to the courts in Chile. Many of them have already been sentenced. And the niece actually met some of those people and met some of the investigators and researchers who have done work on the DINA and the Lautaro Brigade. And she herself, I believe, through the film, became um, convinced that perhaps her aunt was not innocent, as she had said. And that's, that's a kind of journey that we see in the documentary. It is very powerful, and it has led to that um, uh, filmmaker leaving the Chilean jurisdiction because I understand she was threatened, um, in fact, with death uh, by yeah. some Chileans. Yeah, And she does no longer live in Chile. She lives overseas. Interesting, interesting. Um, so, more recently, she has, uh, Adriana Rivas, I think, has uh, attempted to appeal uh, or seek bail. Um, that, I think, has been the third time she, she has applied and she's been rejected. Um, what is the case that she's trying to make for, for bail 
Um, and what do you think are the, I mean, what's, what's, what's going to happen in the, in the, in the next hearing? Mm -hmm. So this is the first extradition of its kind between Chile and Australia, and it's based on an international treaty. And the treaty sets out the requirements that need to be complied with for Adriana Rivas to be extradited to Chile. Um, she was um, arrested of the, in February 2019. So it's now uh, well over a year that she has remained in, on remand in a correctional facility in Sydney, in a women's um, jail. Now, early in the piece, she applied for bail. However, because of this treaty, uh, the requirements for bail are actually quite strict. They are not a normal bail application that you would make in a, in a normal criminal matter. And therefore, she was really not able to convince the court at the time, and that was around May last year, that she should be given bail. And of course, one of the main issues is that she absconded whilst the prosecution was on foot in Chile. And, and hence, she's a, um, a flight risk. But in addition to that, there were no other reasons why the court will grant her bail in terms of health. For example, there are no special circumstances to grant her bail when the aim of the treaty is to assist the other country in transferring the person back to where she is sought. So because of that commitment that the Australian government has with other states, they really have to look at these matters in a strict uh, fashion and she did not get bail on that uh, occasion. Then she appealed that decision. The appeal came through, the decision on the appeal came through only a few months ago and it was rejected for similar reasons. Um, and then now with the COVID-19 uh, crisis, she made a further bail application. Once more, she didn't have uh, special circumstances. There are no cases that I'm aware of of COVID-19 in jails or in that particular jail where she is. In Sydney, we have been very lucky. We, as you know, we went into lockdown very early. So the, uh, the dissemination of this pandemic has been controlled in Sydney. And so she couldn't really convince the court that there were um, special circumstances to grant her bail once more. So at the moment, She's waiting uh, to go into the main hearing of the extradition request, and that, and we that is fixed for June, um, later on in June. Now she may have some difficulties presenting her evidence. Uh, she has requested extensions of time on many occasions to provide evidence in the different instances for each bail application for the appeal, etc. So uh, hopefully we do go into the hearing, but uh, but there may be a further delay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so just two more questions um, at my end, um, and the, the first one is, um, I mean, if, if we if we move to other parts of, of Latin America and and other experiences, in the case of of Guatemala, I think um, it would be fair to say that there there hasn't been much accountability in terms of uh, the generals that uh, committed, uh, according to the United Nations, uh, genocide. That's a term that they used in their late uh, report in the 1990s, from memory. Um, but in the case of Argentina, of course, General Videla, who was himself the head of the junta um, at, at one point, ended up uh, li living his last days in, in prison. So I think in, in Argentina, it, there's an example of a lot more accountability. My own understanding of Chile is that it has a, a mixed record. Contreras himself was sentenced to something like five or 600 years prison and actually died in, 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 in prison. Um, but there are human rights organizations that argue that the Chilean judicial system still needs some reforms. And I would ask you, uh, based on, on, on those critiques, what are the chances of Adriana Rivas, one, receiving a fair trial, and two, um, if, she is, uh, if she were to be found guilty, um, actually receiving some, some punishment uh, according to, I guess, to, to fit the crime or the crimes? Um, interestingly enough, um, we have just seen the um, uh, decision of the Appeals Court of Santiago in relation to about 30 other co-defendants of Rivers. 
that when we talk about co-defendants, you need to understand that because the Lautaro Brigade was an extermination brigade, they actually killed many dozens of mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. These seven people in the extradition request are just a small number of victims. So the courts at the moment are dealing with something like 40 other co-defendants. And we've seen the second um, instance or the second appeal uh, judgment coming through just recently in late May. It has confirmed uh, the more serious sentences for the main instigators of those crimes. Um, uh, it has absolved uh, some of the um, defendants, um, just a, a very small number, either because they have mental health, uh, severe mental health uh, conditions such as Alzheimer's and dementia, and some of them have actually died. And it has, um, so it has maintained some sentences, it has absolved others because really because of humanitarian reasons, and mm -hmm. that is provided under the law in Chile. And finally, it has reduced some of the sentence for some of the core defendants in Rivers' matter. She talks in, her, in the film and in the interview with SBS about one of her friends uh, and some of those friends uh, have already been sentenced and certainly to um, several years. So I imagine that if Adriana Rivas is in fact extradited to Chile, there is a high chance that she would receive a sentence similar to that. Um, the uh, co-defendant co and friend of Adriana Rivas confirms she was a member of the Lautaro Brigade, confirms that they knew about these illegal arrests confirms about the torture that was going on in the Lautaro, in the uh, Simon Bolivar barracks and so forth. Mm -hmm. So just based on that information, I would be optimistic that if Adriana Rivas is extradited, she may, she may be found guilty. If she's not, she will have the possibility of defending herself as all the other defendants have. She will be, she will have lawyers appointed to assist and so forth. At the moment, what we have on a practical level is that she has been in prison for over a year here in Australia. Um, that's quite a lot. And really, a lot of that is as a result of Mrs. Rivers' own decisions in continuing to appeal and seek reviews. She could have consented to being extradited to Chile and defending herself there. And if she did not do any of the alleged crimes, she would have gone free in Chile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is to be seen. Okay, um, and this is the last question and, and thank you so much for your time. Um, I, again, speaking to, to members of the Chilean community that um, we in one way or another were involved in, in, uh, in, in putting pressure on the Australian government and authorities to, to, to actually arrest uh, Rebus. Um, I found it quite interesting um, that one of them said to me, that there are certainly many other DINA uh, agents here in Australia. Um, um, I guess, based on the fact that Australia has a very large um, a Chilean community, historically, um, we are one of the largest communities in the, in the, from Latin America. Um, I, I think that, that certainly is a possibility. Um, what do you think, what, what's, your, what's your opinion about that? And what do you think are the possibilities of actually having other uh, alleged dinner members uh, identified and, and possibly extradited to Chile? Anecdotally, we know um, of other dinner members living within the community. And that is because in the 70s, you might recall the government of Mr. Gomf Whitlam um, here in Australia, he set up a um, system whereby um, it, were, it was easy for Chileans seeking refuge overseas and leaving the dictatorship to travel to Australia. So there was a humanitarian program on foot. And there is some suspicion that uh, Mrs. Rivers and other DINA agents in fact abused that system and came to Australia either as refugee or sponsored or assisted in some way through that program. Uh, there have been cases of Chilean um, citizens and um, uh, who were tortured back in Chile and who have actually met 
uh, with the torturers on the streets and in a shopping center here. So we know of those situations and those people are still undergoing psychological treatment because of the ongoing effects of that torture. And not only psychological uh, damage, but also physical. There have been some, some women in the community who have um, needed ongoing physical treatment because of their internal um, harm and damage and injuries caused by the torturers, some of them who apparently live here. The difficulty we have in Australia is that a lot of people appear to have a, um, changed their names or adopted a different name. And as community members, for us, it is very difficult to follow that through. It really would require a policy, uh, um, a, um, uh, an aggressive policy on the part of the Australian government to pursue those people, to pursue those links and that information, to be able to establish how many of them are still living here. We've heard of two at least who have actually died in Australia, two former Medina agents. Um, and um, so it, it is difficult, but I would say that the information we have that is somewhat reliable uh, talks about at least um, 10 or so DINA agents in addition to Adriana Rivas. And that's why this extradition is so important because if it is successful, it will open up an opportunity also to investigate the possibility of finding exactly where those people live now, uh, connecting to Chile and to the human rights program in Chile and see whether or not it is feasible to pursue those former DINA agents who still live here. Well, Adriana Navarro, uh, lawyer, uh, human rights activist, um, thank you very much for your time and for your information. Mm -hmm.